Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and this is a follow-up to the very quick overview I gave for the GFX 100S which I've had to test for a couple of weeks. Now this is not a detailed camera review. Um, there are lots of reviews out there. People have looked at the aspects of this camera in detail. This is quite limited. I've got the camera here for a while, really just to acclimatise myself to it. Because next year I'm going to be testing the new two new Fuji tilt shift lenses that are going to be available for this particular camera. And I don't really want to test the lenses having little experience of the camera. Um, I don't want the, using the camera to get in the way. So what have I been looking at in this? It is about image quality. It's a bit about ergonomics and it's also because this is a different camera for me. I've used Canon cameras, uh, this is 5DS, one I currently use with a couple of Canon tilt shift lenses here. Um, I've used Canon cameras since I took up digital professionally in 2004 with the Canon 1DS. Now I've got a video that sort of looks at some of the, my history of cameras as to how I've got to this point here. But I'm seriously looking at this camera as a potential replacement for the 5DS. Um, that's partly because I don't regard the R5 as a significant enough increase for the work that I do over the 5DS. Um, if Canon bring out a better, higher megapixel camera, then um, I will be interested to see what, it ha what happens. But bear in mind that the GFX100S here is uh, not a brand new camera. It's been around uh, a little while. Um, how does it perform? Well, I have to say I'm mightily impressed with the image quality and it's image quality I was really there to have a look at. But first a quick bit of um, about the ergonomics side of things. Now, before I took up photography amongst things I did was um, ergonomics and system design. Uh, so I have quite a bit of experience of, of testing items and I do lots of reviews and things as well. But I'm a strong believer in that when you test something, make a note of your first impressions because quite often your first impressions, you only get that once obviously, um, and they're quite useful in deciding how you're going to use a bit of kit. Now, I'm not testing the video at this. I'm not testing the autofocus functionality. It has video, it has autofocus. I used it, it worked perfectly well. But I'm happy with uh, autofocus at a fairly basic level. Remember, I'm an architectural photographer. I do industrial work, I do commercial work. Um, I don't do sports, I don't do nature. Um, I don't do large collections of people. I'm not a wedding photographer. Always when you look at anybody's reviews of a particular camera, look what sort of photos they do. If they're completely different sort of photos to what you do, then take their comments on the camera under advisement because um, you know, they're looking at it through a, from a particular viewpoint. What did I like? Well, lots of buttons on it that were programmable. In fact, so much that even after a couple of weeks, I'm not entirely certain I've anywhere near optimized this camera's use to how I fancy using it. I can use it effectively. Um, I'm still not 100% convinced I'm using it at its best. But that takes a while, and you should always accept that with any new camera, that you're going to take a while getting to know it. Um, I've read quite a bit of the online manual for this. Um, it's pretty dense gone and um, I think I've found most things I wanted to find on it. But there are still a few surprises that I found out even in the last few days. Uh, for example, for some reason I missed the fact that you could change the top display here to show dials rather than um, the standard sort of display there is here and a histogram as well. Now, it would be really nice if the camera makers, and this goes for all of them, could produce good, um, accurate, raw-based histograms uh, for exposure. I'll come back to exposure in a moment when I show some, some images with the, um, with the camera and why I took them and how I processed them. Um, uh, I like the viewfinder. I like the fact that I can have just the viewfinder um, and have the display, rear display turned off effectively. It's a mode I found missing when I was testing the R5. There was just something that just didn't quite gel for me. I like the range of uh, options here. Now, may well, remember, I only had the R5 for a few weeks to test, so may well be something I missed on that. 
it's very easy to miss things. Um, if I had to go back to using my 2007 Canon 1DS Mark III, perfectly good 21 megapixel camera, get very good results from it. Um, if I had to go back for that, I would have to relearn some functions. So you, you always having to change things a bit. And in fact, it's one reason quite, quite like doing the reviews and things. It forces me to think and think about what I'm actually doing, why I'm doing it, and whether there are better ways of doing it or more efficient ways of doing it. Um, your first thoughts are not always the best. As I say, I like uh, this. I did notice that because I'd swapped the movement of the two dials on the top here for the direction they change um, aperture, I'd got them to change aperture and shutter speed because I shoot manual an awful lot. Um, I'd swap the directions around and the dials, the numbering was wrong. So whilst they showed the correct results, the, there was a mismatch between the order of the numbers on the dials that appeared here and how they moved. Anyway, once again, I could have got that wrong. Um, I'll need to, once again to check the, the manual and see what's actually happening with it. But nice thing here. Um, I find the displays potentially, some of them, certainly in the viewfinder, if you go if you turn too much stuff on, there are so many options in the viewfinder can potentially appear. There are bits appear all over the place that you wonder what they were. There's a little thing on the top here, on top display here, that um, the icon for it, it said STD standard. Um, now, I know now that that is the film emulation type. Um, to me, it looks like a check engine light on the dashboard of my car. And when I first saw it, I thought, why is there a check engine light on the top here? It must be, and I had to look up to see what it was. Now, I have not looked at all the film emulations and things like that, because I've not seriously been interested in film for getting on for 20 years. And I'm not starting it now. To me, the film emulations, I know some people like them, but the film emulations are a bit like Instagram filters. Um, I don't really want to do that sort of stuff. I want to make my own decisions on how the images come out. But anyway, yeah, it's it's a very nice camera. It worked very well. What about the pictures that I got from it? I've got some examples here and I'll cut them into the video as well so you can see them a bit more clearly. Um, a basic shot taken in daylight um, just shows the sheer amount of detail that you get from that 100 megapixel sensor. Um, I'm going to show right at the end of this video a little bit about the multi-shot option as well, which I experimented with a little. But I was primarily interested with this camera in what are the files like that you get out of it? Well, they're big, obviously, but you know you don't buy a camera like this if you're worrying about storage and the likes of that. Um, the card I had with it worked perfectly well, nice and fast. Um, I did initially manage to lock the camera up a few times. Um, I've no idea how I did it. I've not managed it recently. So obviously there was something I was doing, but um, yeah, it, it's possible. Fuji were very helpful and they said, what did you do to make it make this happen? And I said, I've no idea. I've not been able to duplicate it. So we'll just write that one off unless it happens again. Um, this one has been updated with latest firmware and everything, so it shouldn't be a problem. But anyway, there's a, there's a uh, picture um, taken at De Montfort University, not far from here, a place I use when I'm testing a lot of things. Now, the two lenses I had was a 30 millimeter here and the 23 millimeter. Now the 23 millimeter is a hefty chunk of glass, very nice lenses, both nice lenses, um, but the wide angle lenses, which I like using, I quickly realized why I use shift lenses so much. I like having a bit of shift. So um, I will, as I say, be very keen to see what happens next year when Fuji bring out their own versions of shift lenses. I would at some point like to see how these lenses here, how they perform on this with an adapter, but we'll have to see if we can arrange some future testing and some things for that for me to have a look at it. But there we go. There's a basic image, 2 50th of a second. It was handheld. I got the image stabilization turned on all the while. F7.1, 100 ISO, the base ISO for it. Use it. No difficulty whatsoever. The images themselves, the raw files, 
I processed them in Adobe Camera Raw and for a few of the higher ISO images and a few other images I used DxO Photolab. Now I used Photolab 5 which does support this camera and these lenses because Photolab 6 won't run on my old kit here which is a bit of a pity because I would have liked to have tried that as well but I was unable to. But uh, really nice crisp images, there's detail there and noise is almost invisible. Yeah, sure, if you delve right into the shadows and really pull things, you can find noise, but it's not there. How does this may change how I use the camera? Well, it means, um, and exposure for this camera, optimal exposure is, a, is an interesting choice you get. You could, I tried taking a few shots on automatic modes and various things, it worked fine. Um, there was no problems with it. The metering seemed to work okay. But I found that by adopting the old exposed to the right or ETTR uh, um, ideas of basically you make sure that your brightest part of your image that you want to keep is not quite clipping. Now, in a lot of scenes, what that meant, and uh, the example I've got here, I've got the small image here shows the shot as it came out, out of the camera, quite dark sky. I've pulled up the shadows and it works a treat. Um, I would, if I tried this shot on my old Canon 1DS, that's 11 megapixels, 2004 camera, there would be all kinds of noise and mush in the shadows. You wouldn't be able to do it. 2007 1DS Mark III, yeah, I'd still get noise. Even on the 5DS, which is a 2015 camera, um, I would, if I looked at this image here, I would start to see issues in some of these, if I'd exposed it um, this way here, similarly as I have this camera here, I would have problems with that image. Um, not insurmountable problems, but already I'm seeing a clear benefit in the shadow detail. And it's effectively that where I've been used to seeing noise lurking in the shadows if you push things up. The sensor technology here is quite different. Now I hear some of you saying, ah, oh, Keith, you should try a um, um, Sony XYZ123 Mark 74. Uh, yeah, by all means, um, if any of you have contacts at Sony, give them a nudge, please. I've asked several times and Sony have no interest in talking to me. I, I'm pleased that the likes of Hasselblad, Canon, even Nikon and Fuji happily lend me kit to play with, but no Sony. So if you do know somebody at Sony, um, tell them hi. Um, and I would quite like to have a look at some of their kit as well, just for a matter of balance. Um, yeah, I use these Canon cameras here almost entirely because of the lenses. Now, I like the cameras as well, don't get me wrong, but I use it's lens choice that matters to me the most, whether it be these, whether it be adapted lenses or other things. So that's a bit about processing that. Now that one hundredth of a second, F9. What about if I really go for the highlights? Now this shot here, both versions of it, uh, sort of out of the camera version and a pushed version of it, bringing up usable detail here and these people in shadow. Now, I've had to do a little bit of tweaking of, um, of levels and stuff, bits to get a, a nice even look to the picture there, but the color is great. There's a tiny bit of sun star on it, umpteen, I don't know how many, how many blades this has, but you just see a little bit. You'd expect that from almost any lens with this. Um, you know, 280th of a second to make sure I haven't really burnt out the sky here around the sun. The tree is, you know, is obviously protecting from the very brightest area. But, you know, I've pulled that one up. I've got no difficulties with it at all. On a cloudy day. Now, this is much more akin to shots I take in part of my architecture work. Um, now, you might have architecture photos. Yes, they're all taken at night under dusk or something like that or under nice, nice sun. I sometimes do not get a choice for the weather conditions when I take pictures of, image, you know, of buildings, particularly in construction and things like that. And it is nice to know that I can go from a day here where it has literally stopped raining a few minutes ago. I can take a picture that I've exposed to get the sky and by the time I process it, 
I've got detail in that sky and I've got nice detail elsewhere in the picture. Uh, I've pulled detail up there. That's ISO 200, um, hundredth of a second. I was taking most of these handheld. Uh, works perfectly well with a tripod as you'd expect it. But I was also testing how good the image stabilization is and um, it really took a bit of work to uh, to show problems in it. Now, all right, if I'm if I'm holding the camera at arm's length and sort of not very steady, it's going to need to be an ex excessively good um, image stabilization system to work for for that. But good camera technique, holding the camera still. Um, I think I managed to get up to half a second okay out of this, which is not bad. Um, so that's clear there. Now, interiors. I've pushed the ISO up to 800 here. I probably didn't need to because this is something that were I to get a camera like this, I really would investigate in a lot more detail the optimal exposure techniques that work for my types of photography. Now, um, I could take perfectly good pictures here with it set on auto and the process, I process the raw files, I'd get good results. I don't necessarily know that I needed to go to 800 ISO. I could have underexposed and just pushed and got detail out the shadows. Great detail here, nice color. Um, I've got no problems with it. Um, so most of the shots I processed using Adobe Camera Raw and latest Photoshop, uh, some with DxO Photo Lab, uh, that works very well. And Photo Lab is particularly good at getting rid of high ISO noise on images from this. So I can imagine that on rare occasions when I do shoot in very low light levels, um, being able to get the most out of pictures. Um, I've not gone above 3200 uh, because I realized that you could set it to 3200 and then just sort of bump up the gain when you were uh, when you're processing the images. Once again, don't take that as a sort of absolute definite, this is how it works, that sort of thing. Um, all of my observations here are temporary. Um, they are provisional based on, you know, a couple of weeks uh, of of having the camera here. So I've got that's an internal. Um, at dusk, this is 3200. Now, a quarter of a second I was leaning on the lamppost to take this particular picture. It's been cropped slightly because uh, it's a wide angle shot. Uh, camera's relatively level um, and I've cropped it for what I wanted. Now, my natural inclination was to think, Curses, I wish I had a shift lens with me because I'd rather use a shift lens for a shot like this. But you don't have to. You can you can often get away without it. But as I say, as a working architectural photographer, I, my natural tendency is to think when I get a picture like this, well, a little bit of rise on the lens will just correct for the convergence of the verticals. It doesn't need it in this instance at all, but that's the way I take photos. So there we go, that's a really nice quarter of a second, 3200 ISO, f7.1, a uh, little bit of movement here. Um, we've got detail in the lit room, we've got detail here in the work on the, uh, on the wall. This particular one, 0.3 of a second, uh, this was taken outdoors later on at night, just to see how it would cope with this range of lights. And this was taken one of the earlier pictures I took with the camera. I was mightily impressed with this um, because when I looked at the detail of it, we'd, not only had we've got all this bright bit here, very little lens flare or anything, but I zoomed right in, and this is, this is using uh, DxO Photolab 5, and there is almost no noise in the picture. I have got fine detail. I can even see the kind of screws that have been used to make this uh, little box that's over the plant pot. So I just go back so you can see, and that is that little tiny box there. And on that, I can actually see they've used cross head screws um, for assembly. I can read writing. There's no worry, uh, no prob no fringing problems I noticed in things. I'm sure I could probably set up a shot to really sort of show it, but it wasn't at intrusive levels. And even in these dark, co these colours bright in the shadows here, very little noise. That's using Photolab, uh, that's using Prime. So it took 30, 40 seconds on uh, my old Mac to process the image here, but yeah, that's, that ain't bad really. But now, 
Here's an example where I've used to take the image, processed it with Adobe Camera Raw, but I've used Sharpen AI, uh, which I use quite a lot, and Sharpen has worked very well on that. I found that the files from this took further processing very easily. You were able to tweak them and do things and run filters and do odds and ends with them, resizing, uh, make them even larger if you want. Um, you're able to do all this sort of stuff without much risk of something nasty appearing in the images, which you can get sometimes. So that was using Sharpen AI just to see how well it worked on the images really well. So I'll finish off on a quick look at the multi-shot mode. Now this is where the image stabilization system moves the sensor uh, a bit, takes multiple shots, 16 shots in this instance. I'm running the camera tethered. Um, I'm taking a picture. I have not got a macro lens, so I'm using a 30 millimeter lens on this. I've got it set up on a tripod and um, I'm photographing the scene here. And the thing I was photographing was um, one of my lucky stones that I picked up on a beach somewhere. This one seems to have a number three written into it uh, through the uh, uh, mineralization, but uh, it's picked on the Suffolk coast. Now, let's just have a look. I've set it to, when I did the, took the pictures of this, I told it to take a picture every second or so, just to keep things stable. Uh, you don't want to move. I know in this room um, that the floorboards, uh, this is an 1880s house, so the floorboards, uh, if I move on one part of the office, the, uh, the even this big desk here will move very slightly. So it's stand still, take the picture, do it. And a convenient little message on the, on the back of the camera, storing images, it may take a while. Yeah, it did. Uh, this one, actually, um, I don't know what I must have set up, something wrong. Um, I found that the system worked really well in terms of making high resolution images. It still felt a little clunky. Now, clunky compared to what? Um, a while ago, I tested the Panasonic S1R. It's only, you know, just shy of 50 megapixels. That has a multi-shot mode. It has a multi-shot mode that I was able to successfully use outdoors. Um, it's really rather smart. And this, the Fuji one, works. It needs refinement, I'm gonna say. I've seen other people's multi-shot modes and they are even clunkier than this. So whilst it's not a problem, I have used better in terms of usability and actual usefulness. Um, let's have a look, there's the software. It took a minute or so processing the images, the 16 images to produce them. What's the difference? Oh, there's the stone, by the way, uh, with the uh, number three in it. Um, looking at that, if I actually look at the detail of it, we've got one of these is a 100 megapixel shot, and the other one is a 400 megapixel shot. Now, from here, looking at the screen, I can see the increase in detail. You're gonna say though, that the number of times that 400 megapixels is gonna be useful is not necessarily that often. Now, I can think of many applications where it would. Art reproduction is one example uh, where I can see that it would be helpful. The more megapixels you have to work from, the better your results are. But don't think 100 megapixels, 400 megapixels. Wow, four times as much data. It doesn't show up that much. It's a 200% enlargement. So yes, if I can just about see pixels, pixelation on this top image here, I can not see pixelation on the one belief. To enlarge things up that much, to use the whole image here, you're talking at sort of six foot by four foot prints with really fine detail. How often do you actually need it? Um, I wish I needed it more often, but finding clients who actually need that sort of stuff is not that common. Um, and if I was gonna use it, I would almost certainly be using it for architectural work, and that is invariably outside. And you have, and I know this from experience using the S1R, 
and, and its system there, your tripod had better be pretty solid and it not best not be a windy day and also ideally not too much traffic nearby because all of those things will throw off systems like this. Now, I admire Fuji for putting it in and if I had this camera, I'm sure I would think of some uses for it, but it's just difficult enough to use on the setup I have here um, that I might not use it as often as I thought I would. Mm, maybe not. Um, that's a pretty minor uh, problem though. Um, so there we go. Um, let's overall, do I like the camera? Yes, please. Do I regret it going back? Of course I do. Um, I regret any camera going back that I've had on loan. Um, but yeah, this is a nice bit of kit. Um, do I have any downsides to it? It's probably a reflection on me as much as anything, but um, I still find it a little complex um, in what it does. Now, that's just lack of familiarity, I'm sure. And if I used it for as long as I've been using the likes of the Canons here, um, I'm sure I'd have no difficulties. Anything else? Well, yes, um, the power supply for USB power supply charges in inside the, the battery in the camera. Um, I would like an external battery charger and also I would like for the uh, adapter and charger here a longer USB lead. Um, I don't like the idea of plugging this into a socket down and leaving the camera on the floor plugged in to recharge it via USB. So um, if I had one of these, I wouldn't use this lead. I'd get myself another USB charging lead, a longer one to cope for it. The lenses, these two lenses were excellent to use. Um, no aberrations, no problems, nothing like that. Um, as I said, next up, Bef I, I hope at some point to have um, some be able to try some other lenses on these cameras and see how other things how they perform on this in particular some of the lower lenses I've looked at the shift lenses are available in the mount for this camera so that would be interesting to try and I've got a bit about more and more detail about image processing where I've made a black and white print from one of these images. Now this is the black and white print. I'll be going into much more detail of it but there is uh, a black and white print of an oak tree. The reason I this shows real promise is that if I put my extra strong glasses on and it's light enough, I can clearly see this as an oak tree. You can clearly see the shape of individual oak leaves on it. Um, but that's a print, a uh, black and white print, printed on the P5000 there. Um, I'll be doing a video about the making of that, about the workflow I used. Um, I'm not going to say it's an optimal workflow, but it's a workflow that's produced a very nice looking print. So I'll be doing some print stuff on that. But anyway, if you've got any questions, let me know. Um, I've got the camera here for another couple of days and uh, then it is uh, dragged away from me. So uh, please do ask questions and if you think of other stuff let me know and I'm happy to look at it. Oh, thanks for watching and please do subscribe to the channel. Thank you.